It's always yes. good uh, to see a lot of networking going on. Uh, we oh, appreciate yes. that. Uh, I'm Lee Colton uh, from uh, Blackstone Launchpad. Uh, Cliff Reynolds uh, from, uh, where are you from, Cliff? Uh, from, uh, <laughs> from Glide, thank you. Glide. <laughs> <laughs> from Glide. Uh, and there's no one that I see from uh, SBDC. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, SBDC is here also. The three uh, entities within uh, Lorain County Community College uh, uh, have come together and bring you uh, uh, this networking event of PB. Uh, we're into our uh, third year of it. Uh, and we've been uh, very proud uh, of the fact that we've had one sponsor the entire time. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts from across the street, Dave Hisson, uh, uh was uh, came uh, with us, came on to uh, board with us uh, from the very beginning, and he has stuck with us, and we really appreciate it. So whenever you're in the area, either across the street at uh, Dunkin' Donuts or in Amherst on 58th or on West 150th in Cleveland, uh, all three of those are his franchises, so uh, we would appreciate if you'd stop by and purchase something and thank him for uh, the continued uh, uh, support uh, of DB3. Without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce you to Judy Keene. As <laughs> some of you uh, may know Judy, uh, Judy has been with us on and off uh, throughout. Uh, I can remember one time when uh, we had sort of a, a short speaker, uh, short in length. Uh, <laughs> and that uh, we needed uh, some time and Judy uh, actually brought in some signage uh, for her business that she was opening up and um, we gave her very honest comments uh, some she liked some I think she didn't like but at least we were honest with her uh, on that and uh, I think hopefully it helped you uh, some uh, in getting in her own mind the, the clarity that she wanted to uh, have on her signage but uh, without any further, Judy. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for having me here. I do have a little bit of a cold, so I'll bear with you if you bear with me, okay? Um, I am here as a business person, but also as an artist. So I'm going to be giving you a different perspective. I'm going to scoot this back so these gentlemen can see me and not just the poster. <laughs> I apologize. Um, First of all, I want to tell you uh, who I am and uh, what my background is. Um, professionally, um, I am the person that graduated from high school, went to college, stopped after a year and a half, went and got married, had children, went back to college when I was in my mid-30s, and I finished my degree in business. So I am the student that went back to college and got my degree. You can do it. And I did it um, through High University and Capital University, and I did the University Without Walls program my last year. So if any of you have not finished college and you got those last six months or whatever, go back and do it. It's not going to hurt you. You'll do it. It'll work. Um, as a um, professional person, I graduated with a business degree and my thought pattern was that I was going to go out and become a purchasing agent. And I did do that. I worked for multiple companies. I worked for Rexon Corporation. I worked for um, DuPont. I worked for Reynolds Aluminum. And I was the person that bought everything that you saw in the plant and everything that you saw in the offices. I met with the salespeople during the time era when I sat down with salesmen over a glass of scotch and discussed things on whether they were going to be um, representing their product in my company. Nowadays, those little gift things don't happen. Everything's gone on, on the golf course. <laughs> you know. And I don't play golf as much anymore, so they need to meet me on my terms. But um, anyways, uh, I had a career in business for about 15, 20 years that I did purchasing. And while I was doing that, I mirrored that with my passion in glass. I am a professional stained glass artist. I've done it for 30 years. For the last 15 years, I've done it full time. Um, I have done it out of my home. Now, the reason why I'm here today is to talk to you about how you can reinvent yourself if you're adding another business to your business 
or if you're taking your business out of the home into a location and that's what I've done recently and I thought that I could share with you some tips on the struggles I've had and the accomplishments that I've had from going through this process. So when I go through um, these statements today, it's not just going to be about um, press items, but it's also going to be about marketing tips as well. So with that said, um, what my business is today. Um, when I started this back, um, probably a year ago, I got a team of people together because I realized that you can do better with your business if you can start delegating things, if you can start sharing your knowledge with other people and getting feedback. I've been a member of a lot of different networking groups, women groups, um, chamber groups. I've been involved with groups that are with my professional organizations nationally. So I'm working with peers that do the same type of work as I do, and then people that are in the business world. And with that said, um, I realized that you need to have somebody that can be a business advisor. You need to have somebody that can help you with your computer issues. You need to have somebody that you can go to when you have questions. You aren't going to know all the answers. And I think sometimes when you're a one-person business, you feel like you have to solve all the problems. Well, if you did that, you'd be up 48 hours a day, and there's not 48 hours a day. So I realized that it's OK to ask people questions. It's OK to ask help. It's also OK to take some money in your budget and put it aside to pay for some professional support. Um, it took me probably a year to really come up with my business plan of what my company was going to be for the future. And the reason why I did that is because tomorrow I'm going to be 62 years old. And I was trying to decide what I wanted to do with my business when I closed my business. So in order to close my business, I had to reinvent and start my business over again because I was taking it out of my home and bringing it to the public in a brick and mortar location. So I was looking at, okay, in how many years do I want to still stay in business? Well, I decided I wanted to give myself nine or 10 years. Okay, so what do I want to do at the end of that nine or 10 years? I want to be able to sell that business. So what I'm doing right now is the stepping stones so that hopefully when that day comes, I can sell this business. And I think that's a lot of, of um, that's a really important thing to look at because I think so many times when people are starting a business, they don't think about the future. They're thinking about paying the electric bill next month. They aren't putting the stepping stones in place of what they need to do so that 10 years from now, they have a viable business that they can sell. And I feel very strongly about it because my husband's a CPA and I hear him come home every night telling me stories about how this third generation company just closed up brick and mortar next week because the next grandkids didn't want to take over the business and they just close it. They don't even sell it. And here you've got three generations that have put invested time in this and they're not making any money on it. So. Long story short, what I'm doing is because I'm trying to do the stepping stones to sell the business one day. Um, what my business was, was a stained glass business that was in my home. I had um, clients that were um, public government clients. I had religious clients. I had residential and I had business clients and I was doing brand new works. I was doing repairs, I was doing um, design, I was doing um, um, repairs that were historical repairs, and I found that it was time for me to get it out of my basement. I wanted to have natural light, I didn't want to have to have low ceilings, so I took the steps planning over a long time what was going to do to get me out of the basement. 
And I researched for three years trying to find the business location I wanted to move to and figuring out in my head what did I want that business to look like in the future. And my attitude was I'm going to do it the best I can and have the best image of what I want that to be. I wasn't going to, to I wasn't going to go for second best. In other words, geographically, when I started looking for locations, I was looking at demographics. Who's my customer was the number one question. You know, how do I want my public to see me? And I decided that I did not want to go into a retail space. I wanted to go into an industrial parkway. I wanted to be somewhere where I was less than five miles from my house. I wanted to be able to uh, have something that had no steps. I wanted sunlight. I wanted handicapped accessible. I wanted a modern building. That eliminated a lot of businesses that are up there for, for rent right now. Um, the space I ended up at was in Avon on Lear Industrial Parkway. It's across from the Primrose School. My cards I left on the table so you can pick those up so you have the address, et cetera. Um, the building's 15 years old. The um, owner of the building, I went in and wrote a 21-page lease for 10 years, and I committed to them that I was going to stay for 10 years. I wasn't going to be one of these businesses that I was going to walk out in two years. I do have three-year options that I can get in and get out of the building if I want to, and I can also sublet. So I wrote it the way I want it. Don't be afraid as women to go in and tell them what you want. Okay, this is really important. Um, you have to stand up for what you want. So, going on with that, now I had to come up with a business name. And I decided that um, my business was called The Glass Studio. And if I put a sign up saying The Glass Studio in front of this business, I was going to be probably lucky if maybe uh, one in a hundred people stopped by or wondered what that was. Well, first of all, I did not want them to stop by unless they were invited or it was by appointment because this is a retail space. No, it's going to be by appointment or by event. And I want to be able to control who comes in to see me. I don't want people stopping in spontaneously. So I decided I had to come up with a new business name. And that was what I brought to Phoebe six months ago. I was struggling with trying to come up with my business name. And I came up with the words creative space, art, and more. Because what I wanted to do was to open a facility that was a multi-purpose facility that can be used for the public for other events and other items other than what my use is. So the creative space means that it could be art, it could be music, it could be business. Um, and then the more was the fact that somebody could come in and teach yoga in the space. So that was how I came up with the name. I also at that point was trying to decide on logo. Do I want to have an icon, you know, a picture of what that object's going to be? And when you're picking your business names and trying to market this, you have to realize that what you're going to do from then on is going to be your branding. And you're going to be identified by that the rest of the time. I decided I want green to represent my business. So what the name turned into was Creative Space, Art, and More, and then under that was Home of the Glass Studio. So sometimes I can represent the Glass Studio. Sometimes I can represent Creative Space, Art, and More. But because of that, now I've come up with a branding that on all of my literature, it's all going to say Creative Space, Art, and More. Now at this point, you have to realize that when you add another business name, or edit your business name, it's OK to let go of the past. I know that's difficult. You've invested money in artwork with logos, et cetera. But sometimes you need to do it. And you have to be consistent with your brand. It's something I'm still struggling with that I have to figure out how I'm mirroring those business names together. 
Um, and you can do that through your website and how you let the public know that you're in this transition period. But it's okay to let go of the past. Sometimes that's an asset because now all of a sudden you can have a grand opening or you can put yourself out there to the public as saying, hey, I'm a new person or I'm reinventing myself. It gives you that option for publicity. So now giving you that information on um, what my dream was on how to reinvent the business and what my background is. What I want to talk about is um, the fact that, um, let me see here, uh, we're going to go into the press. How did I get myself out there? I decided that um, you need to develop relationships with the press. and. To be able to market yourself nowadays, you can't just look at print materials. And print materials can be your newspaper, can be magazines. It needs to also be your online press. It also has to be your social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. I'm still learning some of these things. You know, it's new to me as well. I recently had some artists in the studio that were actual students here at Lorraine Community College. And I said, hey, I don't understand Instagram. I don't understand Twitter. Come help me with this. They came into my office. They set it up on my computer. They did in 10 minutes. I had accounts. They explained it to me, and bam, they were out of there. Ask your young people to help you with that. They'll help you with it. They don't think twice about it. I was shocked at how quick they could put it together for you. You know, you can certainly go get the Twitter book for dummies at the bookstore and that type of thing, but I'll tell you, having a college person come sit beside you for a half hour, give them 10 bucks or 20 bucks, you'll get a world of knowledge. Um, so think about that. That's a way to delegate it to somebody younger than you. Have your kids do it. Um, as far as the press and developing relationships, because of being involved with working in glass for years. Um, I've been in co-op galleries. I've been in galleries that are run by an independent person. I've done juried art shows for over 25 years. I have um, represent myself with individual clients where I go into their homes and businesses and do custom work. And I've done public art that's large scale. Um, you get to be in a position where you have a voice because you're representing other organizations. Sometimes you can be doing an event for a charity. Uh, one of the things that I learned a long time ago that was a really strong marketing tip that I followed was piggyback on something else that's in your area. Like for example, uh, Lorain County just recently had the fire, fish or fish fire or whatever event. That is going to be a growing event. I wasn't able to go because I was sick. But the um, curator here from the college, I think Joan Perch is the one that's um, in, you know, is implementing that whole program. That's going to grow. Uh, from what I hear, it was successful. The, the community came forward with it. If you have a business that you can piggyback with and do something with them, it'll help grow your business. It's giving you good community relations with other businesses in the area. I did the same thing with thinking, okay, what business is out there that's already getting a lot of press that I can put my name with and piggyback with? Well, this is what I came up with. Guitars. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, okay? I've done four guitars for the Rock Hall. Because of this, I've been in loads of newspapers. The reporters have come to me and asked for information. I've been on TV with it. People know me as a guitar gal, okay? So think of Firefish and say, what can I do with my business that I can piggyback in to turn it into your guitar, okay? Now, I did that for a number of years, and um, what I was able to do with that is financially it's also helped me. Even though this was a charity project that I worked on, basically when you do the, the guitars for the Rock Hall, 
they give you a stipend, and this was through United Way, they give you a stipend that basically covers the cost of materials. This was six weeks of my labor, 60 hour weeks, donated, period. What I got out of it is years of history of people knowing who I am because of it. Um, I decided that um, I'm at the point right now with guitars that I've done four of them. Will I do one again? I don't know. I'm on the fence with it. But I've taken it to a different level. Now, I did another sculpture, but it was for Chinatown this last year, for Asia Town. So instead of doing glass, I did all copper pennies. And I reinvented myself in a different location. Instead of doing the Rock Hall, now I'm in Asia Town with this. So what I'm getting at is you can take your skill of whatever it is, and now I'm marketing it in, this, in another location. So think about that. You can use the press. They already have press established for charities. And this is one of the things that I wanted to bring up to you. When you talk to the press, I found that when I've been calling them recently, the first question they've been asking me is, are you a nonprofit? If you're a nonprofit, they treat you differently in the press than if you are a for-profit business. If you're a for-profit business, they expect you to pay for the ads. If you're a nonprofit, you get the press for free, okay? So establish yourself with a charity or something that's a nonprofit so that you can get your business name out there for free, okay? That's a good tip. I don't think people realize that. Um, now as far as um, what I've done as far as establishing relationships, because of this, people sent photographers to me. They sent reporters to me because they wanted to come out and photograph what I was doing. Find something in your business that's unique that will allow the press to want to do a story about you, to do an editorial. Um, the other thing you can do is you can write letters to the editor. You know, do something to complement what's going on locally. Get some attention. I think that um, what I've tried to do is to contact the different newspapers and say, uh, hello, I'm so-and-so. Who do I need to talk to? I'm in the city of Avon. Who's your reporter for this area? How do you want me to submit news releases to you? Develop a press kit. And this press kit needs to have these types of things in them. They need to have a company overview and purpose. They need to have a bio. You need to have any recent news cover that you've had in there. You also need to tell them what your news is that you're trying to, pre to present. Dates and concise facts for the events. Your contact information. So many times people will submit things and they don't give them you your contact information. One of the pet peeves I have right now, and it's been going on just in the last week, I have people texting me and they'll send me information and they'll say so-and-so, so-and-so, and I don't know what the person's name is that's sending me that message because all I'm getting is their phone number. It irritates the living daylights out and then I'm writing back, who is this, you know? <laughs> Make sure you put your contact information on every printed piece of documents that you have. When you are also doing that, tell them what social medias you're using. Put the Facebook icon, the Twitter, the Pinterest icons on that information so they know what you're doing. Um, the other thing that you need to do is with that press kit is put down what section of the newspaper you want this information to go into. And the reason why I'm telling you that is if you're submitting, say, an event, um, you're having a, a coffee and it's going to be the third week every month, have them put that in the calendar for your community news. It doesn't have to be an editorial or an article. They'll put those in for free, okay? Now, when it comes to putting in an article, sometimes you have to pay for them, sometimes you can get them for free. The articles that I have up here are all articles that were put in the newspaper 
the first month I was in business when I did this in June. So I was in seven different newspapers. I contacted them. Two of them I paid for. The other five were free that they sent reporters out and photographers out to do this. Um, there's different types of papers out there. And you have to be aware of them. Everywhere you live now, they have what I call the, sm the small mom-pop newspaper. You know, it could be the Villager from Crocker Park, which is a community newspaper, but you go in Drug Mart and it's free. Well, you know what? The Villager newspaper is my number one reporter. I love Bob Thunberg. When I call him, I tell him in advance where my activity is. He shows up, he takes photos, he'll put it in if he thinks it's a great event. If he doesn't, I pay for an ad. He's covered me for years. Um, newspaper articles. I've had reporters where they've called me and if a reporter calls you and wants to schedule an interview, you have to realize that your time is precious to yourself. You have to be concise and say, yes, I can meet you on such and such day and I can give you so much time. Because what I'm finding is when you're going into small, some of these small newspapers, they're hiring a lot of college graduates. And they're sending them out there and they're wanting to do Q&As with people just to get their feet wet to get newspaper articles out. And I had someone call me recently that this girl just went to the newspaper and she came out. She drug this interview like for an hour and 15 minutes. Give yourself a half hour and say, I can give you a half hour time. Don't, and, and what I prefer doing is giving them a list of questions to ask me instead of them spontaneously asking questions. I've also done this with TV, TV interviews. Um, if you give them, feed them the questions, then you're prepared to answer that question and you're directing the conversation the way you want it. But this particular girl that came out for the Q&A, she came in and um, when it was all done, I said, you know, the, the one thing that I tell all reporters after I've interviewed with them is, please let me know when this is gonna be printed, what issue it's gonna be in, so I can get the paper. There's been so many times that articles have been written about me and they're in the paper and I don't even know it and it's been printed and it's two weeks later and I find out and I can't even get a copy of it. I found out last night, and this is something all of you should do. I went online and I Googled my name and then I Googled my business name and I searched for all the headings that came up. This article that the Q&A about this reporter was in on the 15th and I didn't even know it had been printed. And I read the article and wasn't real happy with some of the information in there and how she presented me and the editor's probably going to be getting a phone call from me because it's very evident from the way the article was written that he never proofed her article. There was errors in here, there was mistakes in here, the grammar was bad and I don't want to be represented that way publicly. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is if something goes on with the way you see yourself presented, you can give the information to a reporter. They don't always present it the way you want it. I had an article that was written here that said my grand opening was in June and my grand opening was in July. It was saying that people were supposed to be showing up at my business in three days. How would I have taken care of that. I called the editor immediately and I said you have to do a reprint on this because your reporter failed to do this correctly. I don't want people showing up at my door. So you have to proof your articles and believe me if you submit an article to a newspaper and you give them the written text like this, they're still going to screw it up. There's still going to be misspellings. They'll misspell your address, your name, everything. They still do it, even if you give it to them. I guarantee it. They're, every article I've ever had has always had errors in it, whether I've written it or whether another reporter has done it. So keep that in mind. Um, when you are submitting articles, sometimes you need to submit your own photography. You need to find out from the newspaper 
what their JPEG size requirements are that they request. The other thing to keep in mind is if you're writing articles and you're submitting them to consider, remember if you're Apple people, you have to switch your docs to pay, from pages to doc because they're going to want it um, for what your um, Microsoft computers, et cetera, are using. So you're going to need to convert those documents. The same thing, um, sometimes you need to find out whether they want it in JPEGs or whatever. So find out what the requirements are of the papers. And it's not consistent from paper to paper. You can go into one newspaper and they may require this size JPEG and another newspaper requires this JPEG. Um, I've written some articles for some magazines and I ran into that problem with magazines where I've had things publicly printed nationally and you need to look at everybody's uh, requirements because they're all different. Um, request copy of guidelines um, that you can get so you know your photograph and your standards um, and the measurements. When you submit your um, what I call press kit, if you want to submit something to the newspaper, Put it on paper that is not your normal copy paper that's in the printer. Put it on a little bit heavier stock, okay? It's going to give a different impression. The other thing that's out right now, I'm just turning, giving you this term. They're calling it an EPK. That means electronic press kit. Um, you're seeing this now with people that are involved with... Um, the music industry or something where they're involved with getting videos done, people are putting things on flash drives and submitting them now. And um, the press is okay with that. They like the flash drives, okay? When you are um, Talking to reporters, no, like I said before, you're going to have good reporters, you're going to have bad reporters. I have favorite reporters. I have unfavorite reporters. I found that <coughs> it's okay to go over someone else's head. If you're not getting what you want, talk to someone else. Um, the, um, let me say, know your customer, know your competitor. When you are presenting yourself in the press, remember that you need to know who your customer is and you also need to know who your competitors are. So do your research. Look at what your competitors are doing. Look at Crane's report. Um, look at what else is out there that's a similar business and how they're advertising to the customer. It's very, very important. The bottom line is you want to have a consistent image and you want to have your name out there as a branding thing. I think that um, so many times people don't try to establish yourself as a brand. You try to establish yourself as your personal name. I personally do not like business names that are person's names. That's just a thing I don't care for. I think, you know, it, your name, I guess in some ways, can be your brand, but when it comes down to it, you're selling a bottle of water. That bottle of water is not your name. So you might want to just develop a tagline if you're using your name as a business name. In other words, if you're Sally's Beauty Salon, Sally's Beauty Salon um, curls and bells or something underneath it. You know what I mean? You need to have a tagline, okay? And put those on your business cards. Um, right now, the one thing that I do want to tell you that I think is very important, to be in business today, uh, the best way of giving you an example of this is I have a lot of photographer friends. And a lot of them are still using um, cameras that are with film and have not gone to digital cameras or they have not used our point and clicks that all of us have anymore. 
and that's making them dinosaurs. Well, the business that I do, stained glass, I'm really a dinosaur, and I, I tell a lot of my friends, you know, when they're talking about their businesses, I'm a rarity in my trade because there's very few people out there that do what I do. So I can market myself accordingly to that. It's uh, a strength that I can add to my tool belt. So when you're looking at um, developing yourself, find what's unique in your business that sets you apart from someone else because those are the strengths that you need to pull on to market yourself. I think that um, today to succeed, and you're not going to like this, you have to be on social media. I'm sorry, but you do. Um, I also don't think that the newspaper is the way to advertise anymore. I honestly feel, and this is from my personal re recent experience, from having two events recently, the way I got people to the events was through social media and by email and by personally calling and by personally coming in contact with people and talking. I spent over $500 on two ads. This one and another one that's not up there with Mimi Newspapers, Vander Havens. I thought, Oh, this is a, a niche newspaper that um, is marketing to homes that are over $225,000. It'll be my clientele. I need to put this in their home. I had somebody walk in the next day, got my newspaper out of my business mailbox and walked in my office and they saw the Mimi newspaper and they picked it up out of my mail and they went like this and they said, oh, you don't need to look at that. Before, didn't know I had put an ad in that and that was why it was in my mailbox. And boy, was that an eye opener. It was like, how did the public react to Mimi? And then I started looking at it and realized when I opened up the newspaper that it was chiropractor, it was uh, bathtub people, it was window people, it was furnace people. I was one of the only art people they've probably ever promoted. They w came after me because they wanted to get a different image. Was it good for me? No. Good for them? Fantastic. So spend your marketing dollars wisely. I should have done a little bit more research. Now, there's a little glitch going on right now with reporting. I want to make you aware of this. When I sign with Mimi, I sign for three ads. Not wanting to, but that's how they're doing their ads. They suck you in, and you can't just do one ad, you gotta do three. Well, I called her after two and I said, there's no way you're getting the money out of me for the third ad, period. I'm breaking the contract. I said, what I did was for my events, I actually pulled the people that showed up and I said, how did you find out about this event? Did you find out about it from email, um, personal contact, newspaper, or did you get it from social media? Not one person, and I had hundreds of people come to this event, not one person has mentioned the Mimi ad to me, either one of them. So that was $500 that maybe eventually in six months someone might walk in and tell me they saw it, but maybe not. Um, there's also the rule of seven. You have to get your business name out there seven times before somebody's going to remember that name for branding. And you need to be doing it at different locations. And you can do it through your networking, you can do it online, you can be doing it through emails. So don't be afraid to be channeling your uh, publicity in different ways. May I just add the thought when you said seven times, because in education, we were always told, you say it seven times for it to stay in their brain. That's a proven business role. Yes, exactly. So, but also in education. So I just had to say, wow. Oh, that's, yeah. Nice yeah. to see them both agree. Yeah. So um, as you can see here, I've had photographs. Um, this is an ad where they announced <laughs> it, but because I wasn't paying for an ad, they controlled how they were going to do it. This one, um, they gave me great coverage. 
Another thing that happened was um, this, this ad here, Julie Short, this was in the Sun Sentinel. Sometimes if your article is written in a smaller paper, it can be picked up later and go elsewhere. This also went to the Plain Dealer. It also went to the Plain Dealer online. It went to Cleveland.com. It went to Cleveland Live. So your articles can transfer through um, however it gets dispersed and they will take a life of their own. Some of my articles that have been local have gone national. So you, if you can establish yourself as an expert in the field locally, sometimes that can help you. Um, I can't remember what it's called, the Huff, um, what is the, the Post. yes. I, I'm an expert with Huffington Post and they'll contact me for certain things in the glass industry sometimes and I'll uh, give reporters information. And if you can do that in your field, that helps. The, um, and the biggest thing that I want you to know is try to give back to the community. Um, you have to do something in a volunteer capacity with your business. It's not going to hurt you. It's going to help you immensely. The public's going to like it. And uh, don't be afraid of selling yourself because if you don't, who will? Okay, now at this point, um, pretty much gone over everything that I was going to.